Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I know that pe many people think that this tax will be the most exciting panel of the day, um, <laughs> and our goal is to prove you right. Anyway, um, let's just jump into it. Mark Pui, can you talk about your organization and what you're doing? Sure. Okay. So by way of a quick introduction, so MW Partners, basically one of the, um, I think, leading um, private investment funds in the tech space. We were there since uh, 2016 plus, and I think uh, most of the partners retired out in 2018, including some of our very young 22-year-old partners. Um, and uh, since then, we just do a lot of private investments, and we do it in layer one protocols, various things uh, from scale to Filecoin, unfortunately to Terra as well, um, and that. And then also, uh, recently, I co-founded Levitos, which is basically a premier data analytics platform. Uh, they do it for the spot and derivatives markets itself. Fantastic. Bob Kickbush, IRS Criminal Investigations Division, representing the Joint Chiefs of Global Tax Enforcement. Can you tell us about this J5? <laughs> Yes, the Joint Chiefs of Global Tax Enforcement basically is uh, five countries, the United States, Australia, Canada, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom. And they basically, it's the tax enforcement authorities of each of those countries working together uh, to help, I guess, grease the wheels of uh, information sharing in the tax investigation space and also the money laundering space, especially as it relates to cryptocurrency and cyber crimes. Appreciate it. And since this is a panel about crypto and taxes and digital asset adoption, let's go a bit deep. We're in Singapore. Lots of people think that crypto is not taxable. Is that true? I'm sitting next to uh, IRS criminal <laughs> investigators. So the last thing I'll think is say something wrong. So, okay, so I think there's this perception about crypto. I, I, firstly, it starts off the fact that people think it's decentralized libertarian movement. So a lot of people are managing their own money and there's a lot of tax avoidance. Let's face it, that was the early days of crypto. You know, we would be doing a lot of OTC trades and you know, it's, people don't really know where, it, uh, where it's at. Because I remember those days when I used to trade at 2012, 2020, 14, um, and I'd be buying and selling uh, Bitcoin at 10% plus spreads on 150 to 200 US dollars per, per Bitcoin in those days. Now, the truth is, it's a capital gains and there are a lot, of, a lot of havens, a lot of jurisdictions are capital gains uh, tax-free nowadays. Uh, Singapore is no exception. But the way regulators or policymakers look at it is often what's ultimately the purpose of the transactions, the frequency of the transactions, and the holding period of the transactions. These are ultimately three things that they have to look at. And really, when you think of what you're doing with your, with, with, with your, with your cryptocurrency trading or activities itself, you really should consult the, 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 the tax authorities or the proper tax agent itself. And, and try to understand whether or not your activities uh, fall as something as capital in nature in the gains and losses, or is it actually that you are running like a market-making uh, bot and that's running at like 20,000 transactions a day and that certainly doesn't seem like um, a capital gains, a capital gains activity. Yeah, now that actually is what I find in talking with many governments, that although they'll have a favorable regime for crypto and people will focus on crypto gains beyond a certain holding period are not taxable, or we're not going to tax it until this time, there are instances where you engage in certain activity with crypto with sufficient frequency or expertise, now you're in a business, so those rules relevant to retail investors are not relevant and you're taxable. And indeed, in chatting with a couple partners at Big Four in Singapore, that's exactly the advice that I heard. Um, Bob, is that relevant from a, from a U.S. tax perspective? Is crypto taxable? Are there, is there any, any free pass? Uh, no, no, no free pass. Uh, yeah, in, in the United States, cryptocurrency is treated basically like property. So if you're, in, if you're in a business and you get paid in cryptocurrency or you're mining cryptocurrency or even like an airdrop of cryptocurrency from a hard fork, it'd be what we consider ordinary income, the same type of income you'd get normally for earning wages or, or business income. But uh, if you then hold the cryptocurrency for more than a year, it becomes uh, basically a, a capital gain and or loss. And then uh, that would allow the, the tax rate to be a little bit less for most people. Okay. And in terms of enforcement, what kind of crypto tax cases do attract the investigation of someone like you with the criminal tax division? Uh, so, uh, you know, basically anybody that's involved in willfully taking steps to avoid paying income tax and avoid hiding or, or and they try to hide the money or basically you know take steps to, to, to make it so the IRS doesn't know about money that was earned, that's what can make it criminal. So it's really the same thing that would make any kind of 
criminal tax case with, with ordinary traditional finances as well. It's, it's the same thing. It's really about that willfulness and the steps to hide the income. Yeah. What I found interesting about what you each have said is that there are, are no bright lines, for example, with certain, with certain issues. At least in Singapore, for example, there's no bright line with regard to who's in a trader, who's a trader, who's super active, but it, it's sort of like art in the United States. We, we know it when we see it. And therefore, if you are such a, a very active trader, then you could fall yourself into tax. And unfortunately, people are a bit lax. And to your point around um, what attacks the attention of criminal investigators, well, if there's this, things are so clear, you're obviously intentionally flouting the law, you're not going to go there. But where things are gray, people still transact. And that's really a matter of civil tax enforcement. Um, there are many issues that are gray, but still, you know, that doesn't stop people from engaging in them. They just proceed with a bit of risk, so to speak. Yes, correct. Yeah. Um, so let's pivot a bit to hacks. In chatting before the panel, it's a very relevant topic that each of you have uh, perhaps personal experience with. Um, Mark, can you talk about some of your own personal experiences and your thoughts around how law enforcement can be made an ally in the area of hacks. Okay, so it's one the because bearing in mind that I've been in the space for a very long time, so sadly I'm on the I'm on the leaderboard for one of my wallets got hacked. I think that's for over two to three million US dollars. Um, so, but I'm 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 kind of past these things because it's it's the nature of crypto um, and these transaction approvals uh, and so forth. But um, I think that the reality is that it's very difficult to. If, if, you are, if, you are, if you're on the wrong end of a hack itself, it's very hard to recover. So it's very, um, I guess, distressing uh, about these things. Um, but the reality is that if you look at the history of the cases uh, that have been out there, and I think the most recent one is um, the Bitfinex hack, hack, hack recovery, uh, of, which, of which I went to be a direct shareholder of the exchange itself, that took six years for a recovery process, right? Before, and even then, it's still going to take some time, right? But I think that shows that the long arm of the law will still pay attention to these type of cases itself. Um, but then again, it really depends. Sometimes if the hacks are a bit small, you take off $20 million, maybe it's a bit under the radar, it's disseminated to Tornado and so forth, then it gets a bit more to get the recovery on, on it. But I guess, you know, take comfort in the fact that I believe that the, the authorities around the world, if it's reported, will work towards a resolution. Got it. Hey. And Bob, you've got some experience around hacks. Can you share some experiences? And I know we, we, you brought a few um, um, items to share with us. Sure, sure. So uh, there is this hospital system in uh, Pennsylvania, where I'm from in the United States, uh, called the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And you can see the picture there on the slide. Uh, that's, it's the tallest building in Pittsburgh is basically their, their headquarters. Um, it was hacked in early 2014, and uh, how, we, how IRS became involved in the investigation was uh, in February of that year, I think about 17 people had false tax returns filed using their identifying information, and then of course, you know, with the intent to get a refund uh, deposited to the, the criminal. And uh, from the course of like February to May, when you see this article here on the screen, uh, basically they determined that every single employee's identity of the entire hospital system was hacked, which represents you know, approximately about one, of the, one out of every five people in Pittsburgh. So it was a pretty major event uh, in Pittsburgh where I live. Um, so basically, I, I started the investigation. There was really twofold. You know, I had to figure out, well, who was filing these tax returns? And then you know, knowing that the hospital system was hacked, who hacked into the hospital system? You know, and, and, you know, basically we found out during the investigation that they, they sold the identities on the dark web, um, and then the people that bought the identities filed the false tax returns, and you can see there, there was about 1,300 tax returns filed that claimed about three million in tax refunds. And so uh, through, through the investigation, and, and primarily through a, a cooperating witness that uh, had also bought the identities and then got caught subsequently by the police in California, and then uh, you know, basically told them the story of where he got the data from, uh, they, basically, uh, we learned that it was someone named the Durf Star, and then he also went by Durfy Star on various uh, dark websites, and he was the one that hacked into UPMC, we presumed, and then was, he was the one selling the identities. And so, uh, you know, it was an investigation with a lot of challenges, especially given the time frame of 2014, 2015, 2016, uh, when this was primarily being investigated. 
as law enforcement, we didn't really have a good way to get onto the dark web. You know, it was something we had heard of, but how do you access it? How do you get onto it? Uh, we actually used a cooperating witness from another case that had been arrested in a cyber crime to be able to get onto the dark web for us and research this bad actor that we knew of as the, Dar the Dirt Star. And then uh, we found other people that had engaged with him. You know, how do we identify them? How do we interview them? How do we convince them to help us out in the investigation? We were able to do that in a couple instances, which certainly helped, you know, show that he was selling, you know, identities on, on the dark web. And then uh, uh, there was a lot of evidence in foreign jurisdictions. So in order to file a, a tax return in the U.S., as this was done, in order to electronically file it, they had to have an email address. So those email addresses, there was 1,327 of them. We needed the data from those accounts to help track down, you know, where the money went and who, who did who filed the tax return. So it was about reaching out to a lot of different countries where these email providers were based, because there was a number of different ones used. We had to do that quickly. We had to follow up on IP address information, get that data quickly to try to like track down everything. And then uh, you know we were able to get a lot of informal cooperation from various countries to be able to do that, and then later follow up with official legal process uh, later. And then of course, things sold on the dark web involve cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency, especially back in those days where you know chain analysis was kind of just getting off the ground, it was really hard to track and figure out you know where was this money going, and that's part of the reason why this investigation actually took seven years was because we had to wait until the tools kind of caught up to the crime to be able to go back and see exactly where this money went. So just to kind of give an example of the different countries involved to get evidence. You see like Japan, Malaysia, United Kingdom, France, you know, various other ones on there. And really the, the key evidence for this investigation was actually found in Japan and then Finland and the British Virgin Islands. And, you know, this is basically a hospital system that was hacked into in the United States. The hacker, as we ultimately found out, was in the United States. And the people that filed the false tax returns were in the United States. But all these countries had to be involved in order to get to the bottom of who did it. And so this is a great example of why like the, the J5 exists and, and other you know, uh, cross-border law enforcement cooperation because you need all these players just to do one simple investigation that really doesn't even technically leave one country until you start trying to follow the evidence. And so uh, eventually we're able to, uh, you know, based on the evidence that Japan was able to provide to us, uh, find a wallet address that uh, the guy, the Dirthy Star, had had asked to be paid at, and you can see there on on this graph uh, it was the one eight one sorry one a eight address, and then you see it got sent to an address one MD, and we weren't sure is this, is this the you know is was this a bad actor just paying somebody else then to local bitcoins and Bitfinex was he buying other things on the dark web or did he just move the money to these exchanges and it was the same person. And so we obviously had to get data from those, uh, you know, uh, crypto exchanges as well, which, you know, two different countries involved. It took months and months to get that information. But after we figured it out that those, both those people were the same person and we dug into that person, we were able to determine who it was. And here's kind of the article when, when he did get arrested. Um, his name was Justin Johnson. He lived in Detroit. He ended up, he was the one that hacked into the hospital system. And when we ultimately did a search warrant of a storage unit that he owned in Detroit, we found out that uh, there was a hard drive in there that had data for over six different companies that he had hacked into and had hundreds of thousands of sets of PII that we then were able to attribute to him. And he also had things in there that said the Durstar, Star, which was the key to the whole case. So. I've got a mic. That, that, that's interesting. It's, it's interesting also that phrase you used, the tools caught up to the crime. And that's really a fascinating concept to, to think of it that way. Um, from the perspective of investment activity, compliance, um, and sanctions, and I know Bob will talk about sanctions in a minute and how IRSCI, um, um, their activities, Mark, how do issues around sanctions really affect you when you're deciding to invest in a company and evaluate? Uh, well, firstly, just to take off from the last thing that Robert was showing, crime doesn't pay. You're better off uh, inventing a layer one protocol, a successful L2 project, than trying to uh, steal funds in the, in the longer run. The authorities will catch up with you. So, so how do sanctions affect you? I think uh, sanctions have had a chilling effect. I think uh, it will ultimately, uh, I, I've seen uh, some really talented uh, teams 
uh, that I've worked with out of Russia. Uh, you know, they're, they're running short of funding. There are a lot of people who just don't want to deal with them even though they're not officially on the sanctions list itself. So how do we get funding to talented Russian companies and Russian projects itself? Um, we see a lot of uh, gravitation of uh, uh, projects, uh, teams that are also moving to Dubai nowadays, which also happens to be where a lot of Russian money is headed towards. So I expect a sort of confluence of, uh, of uh, um, both opportunities as well as uh, potential, uh, uh, you know, uh, potentially, so we should say, um, dodgy sanction avoiding investment activity, right? So I think, I think that's dangerous, right? I think it's important to acknowledge that this will have a chilling effect um, in the immediate term, but regulations is tightening up. And I think this was a, a story that I was going to share because in the early days, right? I mean, I, I'm saying this from the, you know, prior, before I retired from PwC uh, four years ago. Uh, back in 2012, 2014, I was in the space really early. I still remember 2015, 2016, thereabouts. Um, because I was running a private OTC desk itself. Um, uh, the space was still early, spreads were still wide, and I used to have this uh, fellow that would come across from uh, Indonesia every once in a while, um, and he'd basically just bring a digital wallet. He'd be in traditional Islamic garb. I'd meet up with him, no discrimination. Uh, I'd take him to the private bank at CIMB itself, and then I'd do an OTC transaction with him. Um, and he'd never want to do a bank-to-bank -bank transaction. He'd only want a cash transaction, hence I, I would bring him there itself. Um, and after a while, I decided I wouldn't do that anymore. So I, I did that for a while. Uh, it was profitable, but I decided to stop doing it because uh, around that time, it was the Jamaya Islamia activities, and I started asking myself, hey, you know what? I'm doing this, but you know, do I really know what he's doing taking up all these cash transactions for digital assets? Um, and this was the early days. So it comes back to where I think regulations are going to tighten up and go from, I think we're going to get um, more stringent. And that's why we are now living in an age where regulations are going to be tighter. We're going to see the age of CBDC come to play, more controls. And I think that's good. I think that's good. That's going to chill out some uh, 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 space of adoption. But it's going to be good for us in the long run. That's what I see. Got it. And Bob, we're talking about sanctions and compliance. Why is the IRS involved, the tax authority? Do, do, does, do you have a role in, in, in policing sanctions? Sure. So in, in the United States, uh, the, the IRS is part of the Treasury Department, which uh, you know, has the Office of Foreign Assets Control, uh, FinCEN, which is the Financial Intelligence Unit, and all that is under the Treasury Department. And so IRS has been giving one of the primary roles of sanctions enforcement in the United States, which is especially relevant now given the events in Ukraine. Um, IRS also has primary investigative authority over a lot of what we would call the anti-money laundering laws or, or violations and crimes, such as uh, you know if someone doesn't uh, file a report when there's a cash transaction report required or suspicious activity reports that are filed or not filed, and then also uh, you know there's another recent law that the, is going into effect I think next year in the United States that will require reporting of cryptocurrency transactions over ten thousand as well as cash transactions over 10,000, and so that is something the IRS will also be enforcing as well. Good. What's, what's interesting is that despite taxation, um, despite enforcement, the, the crypto industry has grown massively, and, and these kinds of things, this kind of activity, I think is the exception. Our own data suggests that you know, less than one, far less than 1% of, of transactions are illicit, but the kind of m monitoring that occurs from a compliance perspective when it gets reported, for example, SAR data, um, suspicious activity reports when it goes in, presumably, to the IRS. Some of that may have wallet address information. And some of that may enrich your ability to do the kind of investigations, not only from a, uh, a, 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 a money laundering perspective, but also substantive tax if that wallet address information suggests substantive activity, which is interesting because it raised the stakes upon compliance and things like that. Um, so uh, switching gears a bit, and we talked a bit about stablecoin and taxes, and I, I think that in the United States, the discussion, for example, is not whether we will have a digitized uh, currency, but how it will be affected. Um, our banking regulator actually issued a statement that um, a, a letter last year that the banks are allowed to issue um, tokenized, uh, well, tokenized dollar certificates, effectively digital dollars, 
where if I deposit a dollar, I have a token, and now people can run around saying, transact with that, and always go back and redeem. Um, Mark, what is your thought on that? Is that something that you've, you've, you've explored from an investment or a strategy perspective? Yeah, I, so, so I've, uh, I've, I've made multiple, uh, uh, quite happily, I mean, I've made multiple investments in this space itself, so I've done all the way through um, to fully regulated chains. That means you deposit your dollars in a bank itself, it converts to USDC and it's trans transmitted to Onfido KYC systems itself. I've done algorithmic stables all the way through the spectrum itself, still doing it. Uh, I've done uh, multi-currency baskets of uh, stable coins itself. So this is a favorite investment space of mine that I focus on. Um, I think uh, my view is that the world will ultimately have a fully regulated uh, stable coin, and like it or not. And this will be highly integrated into our conventional payment systems. You won't even know it. It's like when you go and use your Grab and you're actually, the currency that you're seeing in your Grab wallets is actually a, effectively can, can be converted out to stable coins. I think that's what's gonna happen. In fact, I go one step beyond. I believe that the coin or the token that we see in the future will actually be an interest bearing token. So it will effectively be a tokenized dollar deposit at, for example, a, a bank itself that's being translated around. Right now, what you see when you see in your wallets is effectively uh, non-interest bearing uh, representation of currency itself. But I believe that the world will lead to an interest bearing representation of that currency in a, in a, in a, in a, in a banking institution. On, on the other side, I still believe that there's going to be a, um, a libertarian adherents, adherents who want to see a censorship resistant coin. They'll always be there, those people and I'll support those people still. Uh, but I think um, that's going to be a challenging ask uh, going forward in a world where uh, regulation will continuously encroach and help us progress adoption. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the interest-bearing notion of that is interesting um, in part because, you know, interest is taxable in most countries and you would associate it if you have KYC wallets, yep. um, you would be able to automatically determine who's earning that kind of income at each instance. Exactly. And Bob, from a tax perspective, I think it would be interesting from your, your view is that now if I, with cash, if I receive cash and pay you in cash, that's something that's outside of the IRS's technical ability to audit because cash is truly anonymous. Um, you're really relying on the self-assessment and the trust that you people have in the system. And the IRS has publicly said that um, if there's not third party reporting, there's at least half the time there's not reporting of taxes. Um, the U.S. tax cap is about a trillion dollars a year. With the digital, do with a digitization of dollars, now people holding this necessarily in a wallet that you have access to, it can view. How would that you think would impact your law enforcement uh, efforts? Yeah. Well, as as we know, the the blockchain isn't going anywhere. So for whatever crypto asset someone is using, uh, that the transactions will stay there forever. So it's really just a matter of identifying who holds those wallets. And once that information is identified, it's easy to track and see where that money came from and when. So there's really no hiding once that identification is made. Yeah. So we've been chatting, we've, we're, we're wrapping up here, and we've been chatting for a bit about taxes and you know, some, some, some stories around uh, some unfortunate events with crypto. Um, but from a broader perspective, um, with taxation, do you think taxation will hinder uh, the development of crypto and the adoption and, and, and the, the popularity of its use, Mark? Um, yeah, well, who here loves paying taxes? So <laughs> I think uh, generally, you know, taxes is always going to be like, a, you know, one of the, the, the negative connotations that people always have that they have to pay for, for something that ultimately was, was born out of uh, freedom of money, freedom of movement of money. But ultimately, I believe that it's something that's embraced. You should pay taxes because, you know, you're earning, I mean, you're earning a lot of money already anyway. You know, you've got mining operations, taking operations, and so forth. Um, I think ultimately also what people are concerned about is how taxes are used, right? So if the jurisdiction is collecting taxes on economic activity and putting it to the productive use of its citizens, uh, putting it to the productive use and advancement of, of other technologies, I think I'm all for it. So, you know, I'm all for paying taxes on, uh, on regulated activities. Bob, your views? 
Yeah, I mean, I certainly think everyone should pay their taxes on uh, gains in, in cryptocurrency, but I, I don't think it hurts the adoption because obviously cryptocurrency wants to cross into the legitimate use space and, uh, you know, paying taxes is just part of any kind of financial transaction. It really is nothing different than we've been used to for years. And I would even offer, when you look empirically at the price of crypto, Bitcoin 2014, when the IRS first issued guidance that crypto is taxable transactions, uh, the price of crypto doubled that year in the United States. And in Japan, one of the top five countries in crypto adoption, um, that taxes crypto twice as much as ordinary investment income. Again, crypto is a very popular and growing asset class. So I do think that sensible adoption is, uh, sensible taxation um, has not been at all a deterrent to growth. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks.